We have our time post. This is Kevin Close, acting president of Radio for Europe, Radio Liberty, in Prague, the Czech Republic. I'm delighted to uh, be asked to uh, start this actually quite extraordinary convocation of what will be a discussion that is promises to be both very deep uh, and, and very wide. I want to thank Horton Beebe Center, my friend from many, many years, uh, who is the president of Eurasia Foundation, who started this gathering together. And uh, I'm delighted to be here uh, as, as we can participate with you all, a distinguished audience, a distinguished uh, guest list, and, and a very distinguished moderator, Joshua Faust, who is a man of both present and future. <laughs> <laughs> He's not only present in front of us, but he has a great future presence in the, digi in the digital connected world that is emerging so quickly and so powerfully across time zone, across national boundaries, across oceans, that is bringing people together in completely new ways. He's been a, a very, very important, creative, innovative presence. His narrative, his engagement, uh, and his focus has been very important to give meaning and power as this continuation of, digi of the digital age continues to iterate. So it's a great pleasure to, to welcome Joshua Faust. I'm now going to yield my seat to a great participant. Thank you very much. And we'll be watching here from Prague, uh, both across our wonderful radio radio services here and seeing you all in Washington and elsewhere in this great hangout. Cool. Wow, thank you, Kevin. That was uh, an unexpectedly nice uh, introduction. Um, in, in, in addition to Radio Free Europe's and uh, the Eurasia Foundation's very generous hosting of this, I think we, we can also thank here uh, Christian Carl, who runs the Democracy Lab at Foreign Policy Magazine. He also used to be Radio Free Europe's Washington bureau chief. Um, he published uh, my review of Philip's book, and he's also been, I mean, engaged for such a long time in, in Central Asia issues and publishing on it and writing on it and commissioning new works on it. So. I mean, Christian also deserves, I think, thanks for, for helping put all of this together. Without any further ado, we're here to talk to Philip Shishkin, who is a former Wall Street Journal reporter. He covered Central Asia for a lot of years. And after that, uh, went to the, is it the Asia Foundation or the Asia Society? Asia Society. Asia Society, okay. I get the two confused sometimes. Uh, but while he was there, he ended up writing this rather fantastically interesting book called Restless Valley, which is about Uzbekistan and Kyrgyzstan. In particular, it focuses on the kind of political machinations in both countries. And both of these have been instrumental in a lot of ways to the U.S. mission in Afghanistan. First, in Uzbekistan, the U.S. relied on the Karimov regime there to host a rather significant air base that helped fund and resupply and fuel, I meant fuel instead of fund, the war in Afghanistan. Then, because of Uzbek politics, for a number of reasons, uh, they killed a lot of people in Andijan in 2005. And in the hubbub that resulted, the U.S. complained vociferously about what happened, and the government of Uzbekistan kicked the U.S. out. And the U.S. Uh, retreated in a way, but they moved into Kyrgyzstan. And then Kyrgyzstan began taking on all of the wonderful politics that come with having a major U.S. military presence there. And in the course of that presence happening, this happened within a couple of months of each other, after Andrzej, very soon after, uh, or at about the same time, actually, Kyrgyzstan went through enormous political upheaval. Their longtime dictator, in a way, ruler, president, uh, was essentially chased from town by an angry mob. And for the next five years, the next president essentially broke every sense of promise and hope that he had had. And so he was also chased from town by an angry mob. And now we're left with a new government that actually went through a successful election, the first successful open election in Central Asia's history, recent history, I should say. Uh, and that's kind of where, where Philip comes in and, and sets the scene. Uh, so, I mean, we all kind of know this, this, this general history of what's happened. We're all interested here in Central Asia. But what I wanted to, um, what we're going to be doing is having uh, uh, Philip read some sections from his book, 
give us a sense kind of, of of the personal on the ground narrative that he was able to put together having been uh, a reporter there. And we're also going to be getting some of our wonderful colleagues in Radio Free Europe. I should say, if you if you don't already read it, Radio Free Europe produces, I think, the best English language journalism about Central Asia that's out there. Um, they also translate a lot of local language reporting from their correspondents in the field into English. <laughs> Uh, they're also incredibly open, and if you send them emails, send the reporter emails, they are happy to talk to you about what's happened, and I think they're happy that people take interest in it. So um, they are, they've been an absolutely tremendous interest, and to help us with this, we're talking with Aida Kasimilyeva, uh, who I believe covers Kyrgyzstan, if I'm not mistaken, uh, and Alisher Sadikov, who directs their coverage of Uzbekistan, and both of these reporters have done absolutely tremendous work uh, covering both of these countries, and I'm happy to get their input into the discussion uh, once we move on to that phase of it. So, I mean, without further ado, Philip, do you want to take us to the first part of your book and, and kind of walk us through what was going on and, and what you're talking about? Well, thank you, Joshua. Thank you for the, uh, for the introduction. Um, it's very nice to see all of you here. You know, you sit in a silo writing a book for a year or two years, and then you come out and the sunlight sort of squinting, scratching your proverbial beard, and all of a sudden you see people come out and support you um, and, and read the book or ask you questions. It's very humbling and very flattering. So thank you all for being here. And thank you to uh, Radio Free Europe and the Eurasia Foundation Democracy Lab. Um, as uh, Joshua said, the, uh, the, 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 this is a very uh, well-informed uh, uh, audience about Central Asia. So uh, I won't bore you with the, uh, with the grand sweep of history that, uh, uh, that sort of took place there. As Joshua said, the, the two revolutions in the space of five years in the same country, massacres, intrigue, all of that. You know all that backdrop, I assume, uh, probably better than I do. Um, what I try to do in the book is uh, use that, uh, um, the backdrop of history and all the violence and political upheaval as a, uh, as a setting and, and sort of and populate it with uh, non-fictional characters who lived through that uh, uh, period of time. Um, both powerful presidents, prime ministers, uh, defense ministers, interior ministers, all sorts of officials, but more interestingly for me, um, not so powerful, regular people, farmers, people just caught up in the, in the revolution, uh, low-level cops, uh, or soldiers who get sent to uh, into the middle of a revolution and they have a, a real problem because no decision they're going to make is going to be a good one. If they shoot, they're in trouble. If they don't shoot, they can be accused of, of treason. So uh, that was my I, I idea behind the book, just to uh, tell stories of regular people. And they, um, there's a very narcissistic component to reading your own words. So, uh, <laughs> but I guess it comes to the territory. So, I'll, uh, you know, one of the characters um, in the book, one of the major characters is the... Uh, uh, this person, uh, Medet Sedar Kulov, who uh, quite incredibly was the uh, chief of staff to the first Kyrgyz pre president, and then after that president was overthrown in the 2005 Tulip Revolution, he managed to uh, get reincarnated, uh, so to speak, as the chief of staff to the guy who overthrew um, the, uh, the first president. And he, in my mind, you know, as journalists, we go out into the field and we often look for, as uh, Lawrence Wright has said, we look for mules, people who can carry the narrative weight of, of, of a particular story and make your job as a, as a journalist uh, easier. So, uh, so Medet Sarakulov turned out to be that, uh, uh, that, uh, that mule for me, to use Lawrence's right word. He, uh, he uh, uh, sort of personified a lot of the twists and absurdities of the Kyrgyz history. Here was the guy serving the first president, uh, then flipping essentially and serving the second president, helping him uh, initially what he thought would be a uh, democratic renewal um, of, of, of Kyrgyzstan's, you know, governance, getting disillusioned, realizing that he was essentially helping build a, uh, a very uh, 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 evil, uh, not to mince words, dictatorship, resigning, and then plotting the overthrow of the um, of this of this president he has served for a few years and helped him um, entrench himself. And so the, the excerpt I will read briefly. Um, finds uh, this chief of staff, or former chief of staff now, returning um, late at night from Kazakhstan, a uh, neighboring country where he had held some meetings uh, in his campaign to essentially drum up support and funding for this revolution that he was plotting. So permit me to do this narcissistic thing. Uh, it was well past midnight when a luxury Lexus SUV joined the line of cars waiting to cross the border from Kazakhstan into Kyrgyzstan. Sheltered under blue archways, the Kordai border checkpoint sits next to, to a bridge over a meandering river called Chu. 
at any hour of day or night, scores of cars, trucks, minibuses, and pedestrians laden with heavy bags clog the approaches to the border crossing between the two Central Asian countries. Bishkek, Kyrgyzstan's blessed capital, and Almaty, Kazakhstan's glittering commercial hub, are only 140 miles apart, an easy drive if it weren't for the wild cards of the border. Fidgeting in the back seat, upholstered in plush leather on the chilly night in early 2009, uh, in early 2009, the main passenger of the white Lexus was not accustomed to waiting in line at border crossings or anywhere else. He wore a suit, carried a titanium encased Bear 2 cell phone that cost at least $7,000 and had a leather briefcase whose precise contents would later invite furious speculation, including a rumor that it contained two or three million dollars in cash. He was hatching a plot to topple Kyrgyzstan's president, uh, the man who'd been swept into the office um, in the euphoria of the 2005 uh, tulip revolution. Back when he was the president's top aide, the Lexus passenger would speed past this checkpoint with nary a slowdown, his assistant calling the head of Kyrgyzstan's border guard service ahead of time to warn him of the approach in big shot. Now the border guards not only refuse to wave the Lexus through, but force the car to pull over for extra scrutiny, a development that irritated the main passenger to no end. I'll pause here very briefly. So this guy gets stopped at the border. Uh, what is happening, and he doesn't know it, is the calls get made by the border guards up the chain of command. Um, and a few hours later, the same white SUV uh, essentially explodes in a fireball about 70 miles east of that, uh, of that border crossing. Um, early morning of, of the next day. So by the time the cops arrive on the scene, the Lexus was so, so thoroughly burned that they couldn't even tell how many passengers were inside. Eventually, pathologists suggested there had been three people. A crime scene photo from that morning shows three clumps of black coals with little resemblance to humans laid out on stretchers next to the Lexus, a light coat of snow covering the mountains behind the burned car. Uh, in the photo, the cops in square fake fur uh, hats take notes behind the yellow police line. Though it would take some time to reach full scientific certainty, all the initial evidence that morning pointed to the conclusion that those three mounds of coals had, had once been Sadr Kulov and his traveling companions. The police quickly concluded that it was a freak traffic accident, and Asmonov, this is the guy who confessed to the traffic, to causing the traffic accident, that Asmonov, visibly saddened by it all, was on hand to provide his confession. He was sentenced to 12 years in prison for manslaughter. Despite requests from Sadr Kulov's friends and allies, investigators ignored serious inconsistencies of their traffic accident theory. How come, for instance, the remains of the Lexus driver were found not in the driver's seat, which was empty, but in the passenger seat? I'll stop here. So, uh, you know, it would take another revolution for the, uh, you know, for the, uh, for the investigation to actually run its course and to determine that this was, in fact, a, uh, an elaborately uh, planned uh, political, uh, political assassination. Um, another, so most of the book uh, uh, talks about Kyrgyzstan because it's just, uh, um, for all the unfortunate um, events that have happened there, it's just a godsend for, uh, uh, for journalists and for anyone who's interested in, in, in political change because uh, rarely do you get a revolution and then five years later you get a revolutionary mulligan. So you, you kind of get a, uh, uh, you, uh, you know, you should sort of see the beginnings of this maybe in Egypt where, you know, revolution happens, people get optimistic and then, and then we realize that perhaps, uh, you know, what can follow a revolution can be worse what preceded it and that's, uh, uh, sometimes very tough for us to understand because I think we're most of us are optimists by nature and we assume that when you overthrow a dictator inevitably something good would happen. Um, another part of my, if I have time, I, uh, so uh, a smaller part of my book talk, talks about Uzbekistan as well um, and I was, uh, I know some of the uh, Radio for Europe correspondents were there as well. I was, uh, I was there probably 48 hours after the, uh, after the after the massacre, and you all know what happened. There was a government crackdown. Uh, there was a prison break. A government crackdown, and most of the people who who got killed had nothing to do with the prison break. Uh, most of them were just uh, um, innocent civilians, kids, uh, women. So I'll, I'll read a very brief, uh, um, just excerpt. This is uh, two days after the after the massacre. I, I, I was there, and I was uh, trying to with the help of Abdul Malik Baboyev, a very uh, brave uh, Uzbek journalist, without whom I wouldn't have been able to get anything done there. So me and him um, kind of walked around Andijan trying to talk to uh, survivors. This is before uh, uh, the government really cracked down and intimidated a lot of people there and told them not to speak and put a few of them in jail. So there was still, uh, there was still the possibility to talk relatively openly uh, to, to the relatives of victims. So I'll, I'll read a, a very brief uh, excerpt. Um, on, on, on the other side of town, in a quaint old quarter of low-slung adobe houses with airy courtyards, Yogdarbek Mamajonov was having a great day. He just turned 16, and his mother, Rahima, was planning to throw a dinner party for family and friends that weekend. 
At around 5 p.m., Rahima realized she didn't have enough meat for the party. Yogdor Beck volunteered to go buy more, picked up a friend, and the two wandered off down a maze of winding alleys. Many others that evening set off on similarly mundane journeys to buy bread, to paint a house, or to go home from work, only to be sucked into the widening vortex of events on Babur Square. Babur Square is where the uh, rally following the prison break took place uh, and where a lot of the uh, um, other people died. Um, so I'll, I'll pick up the, uh, with, with, with Rahima, who was uh, uh, looking for, for her son. When I met her, Rahima Mama Jonova was sitting on her morning bench. On her lap, she held an open ninth grade yearbook of her son, Yogdor Beck, who'd gone missing on an errand to buy meat for his birthday dinner. Wearing a dress shirt and a tie, Yogdor Beck looked stern and very, very young in his photo. Rahima recounted the search for her son. Early on Saturday morning, after a sleepless night, she ventured into town, which by then really did look like a gory set of a slasher movie. There were, she says, there were all these bodies piled up on the side of the road. I saw more than a hundred in one spot covered with sheets. I pulled the sheet from every single one to try to find my child. Mama John will pause to collect herself. Some bodies had God's brain spilling out. There was a corpse clutching a loaf of bread and another lying on top of a bicycle. But Yogdor Beck wasn't among them. Rahima and her older son, Kadr John, visited the local hospital. No Yogdor Beck there either, and then went to the town's main morgue. Soldiers were guarding the entrance, and they wouldn't let Rahima in. She cried, so Kadr John went, in, went inside instead. There were so many bodies in there that workers had to stack the overflow in the courtyard. Kadar John estimated the, the number at about 700. He eventually found his younger brother had five bullet holes in his body. The friend who had accompanied Yogdor Beck on the meet by an errand was dead too. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll stop here. There are a few other stories like that in, the, um, in, this, in this chapter. Uh, well, this guy is uh, our ally uh, again, Islam Karimov, who authorized the... Uh, this uh, this this massacre. There's no other way to to call it. But because of the war in Afghanistan, we have uh, uh, allied ourselves with 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 that government. As as Joshua mentioned, uh, following the massacre, the uh, you know the the U.S. spoke out uh, against it, um, and Karimov evicted the American military base. There's actually an, an interesting debate within the administration about how to respond. And Donald Rumsfeld um, um, recounted in his memoir, known and unknown. It's a great title, um, and so he he was he was uh, he was advocating actually a softer response to Karimov, and his reasoning was: look, if we criticize him now, then we're not going to be able to do business with any uh, with any country we consider undemocratic. It was a very sort of pragmatic, realpolitik uh, take, uh, but uh, you know at the time the doves, so to speak, prevailed. But essentially now we have our our dealings with Uzbekistan are essentially guided by the Rumsfeldian. Realpolitik uh, um, view of the world. We need um, help with Afghanistan. We need transshipment, and so we're not really going to uh, criticize Karimov too much, and we're just going to use his country as a, well, essentially as a warehouse and as a transshipment hub, and then uh, then he can do whatever he wants. And he's uh, he's actually enjoyed that position. So I'll probably stop here. It's already too long. Thank you. Thanks, Phil. That's actually a a good pivot for the discussion we're going to have next, which. I suspect is going to revolve around uh, issues of choice. I mean, this is an American audience mostly, at least in this room, so talking about American choices in this region as well. But before we do that, I mean, I do want to bring in our colleagues from Prague, uh, Aida and Alish, or both of you. Um, actually, maybe starting with, with Aida, we can, we can talk about Kyrgyzstan and then move on to Alish to talk about Uzbekistan. I mean, what, what, what was your reaction either, either to his book or to the passages that Philip just read? Okay, hi, Philippe. First of all, I want uh, to uh, say you uh, thank you very much. It was uh, very nice to see you in 2010, just before the uh, presidential election of our new president, Atambayev. And uh, you read uh, my favorite piece from your book because uh, on March 13, I was there when it was crash and uh, uh, Sadrkulu was died, killed. And uh, also, you wrote about the Bazar Korgon and uh, uh, I was uh, also there in June, uh, interethnic uh, clashes in 2010, and uh, your so your book was very emotional for me and refreshing. As a journalist, we saw every uh, uh, tragic situation that you described in uh, your book, and uh, it was very interesting, amazing that you know uh, so deep the region. And um, now it's for, for our country, for Kyrgyzstan, it's uh, very difficult to formulate uh, what we should do. 
and uh, ask some questions after two revolutions, uh, after one ethnic clashes, and uh, we're just thinking, and uh, especially journalists, experts, and uh, your book is very helpful, not for uh, only for Western audience, also for me, who knows the region, who knows uh, his, uh, our country. And uh, if you want to, um, I want to ask uh, questions <laughs> from you now. Uh, in Kyrgyzstan, uh, we have uh, two revolutions, and uh, recently we have uh, very big uh, rallies in Jalalabad, in Jetoguz, uh, regarding to Kumtor. And now uh, we're just, uh, uh, I can say that people understand that they don't want the revolutions again, and uh, now just we are just staying. Uh, uh, on the crossroad and uh, asking from us what to do, what's next uh, uh, steps. And and uh, in your book, uh, we didn't see the situations after 2012 uh, because uh, now uh, it's uh, clear that uh, our president Atambayev is more close and close to Russia. And uh, after 2014, uh, U.S. base uh, will go from Kyrgyzstan. And my questions uh, uh, for you, you, you are in Washington, Washington D.C., and you know maybe uh, mood of the policymakers, what they think about the Kyrgyzstan policy regarding the uh, to Russian. Because we are now very close to Russia, not uh, and going from U.S. I think. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, Aida, and thanks for thanks for reading the book and thanks for the kind words. It actually means a lot coming from someone who uh, knows the region obviously much much more uh, deeply than than I ever than I ever will. So thank you for that. Um, the question about sort of whether where we go forward in Kyrgyzstan is a, is a tough one. As uh, Kevin described, uh, Joshua, a man of the, of the present and the future, I'm a, I am a, I am I'm a, I'm a man of the past. I, uh, I have a, <laughs> I have a, I've really enjoyed sort of reconstructing the uh, the uh, recent history of of, of, of your country. Um, uh, as opposed to uh, uh, predicting the future, though it's hard there. Um, as as you rightly say, there are these uh, um, uh, protests and uh, all, all this tumult in the country. You mentioned Kumtor. Uh, Kumtor is one of the world's biggest gold mines uh, developed by a uh, Canadian company. So after every revolution in Kyrgyzstan, the people come out in the streets and, and demand the mine to be either nationalized or the profit sharing agreement to be uh, uh, revised so that the the Kyrgyz people get more money. It's, of course, a very populist, uh, destructive uh, demand. Um, but nonetheless, the governments are usually uh, either very weak or very populist at the same time, so they kind of jump on this. Um, I think the, the strength of Kyrgyzstan is also its weakness. It's, uh, it has this incredibly uh, uh, a free political culture. I mean, it really is incredible if, if you look at the neighborhood. Um, that, uh, that freedom, and I, I don't use the word democracy, it's essentially freedom and uh, Freedom taken to its most, uh, you know, almost absurd degree in a society that has very uh, weak institutions, and very weak laws, and has very strong clans and and and, and organized crime. So that that very sort of free ruling political culture, the inevitable corollary to that is uh, is uh, is this anarchic nature sometimes of the of the Kyrgyz um, the Kyrgyz politics. Um, so as for the current government, I think it is, uh, you know, it appears to be sort of very ineffectual and at times weak and at times riven by all sorts of pressures and contradictions, both external. You mentioned Russia and, and the U.S. and China, but I don't think, uh, at least not yet, that that, that that government is not anywhere near of the uh, of the ineptitude and and, and 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 evil of its of its of its predecessor. Um, as for as for the uh, the relationship with Russia, I think Kyrgyzstan basically probably has a. Uh, uh, very little choice uh, here. Um, so the uh, you know the lease on the U.S. base expires soon, and it's it's always one of the um, wild cards in Kyrgyz politics. You know, should 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 the U.S. stay or should the U.S. go? And it's there's a push and pull. Uh, uh, the base has been near uh, uh, has been very close to being evicted many times. It never really was evicted because there's oh, they're always behind the scenes negotiations about more money. Um, I don't know what will happen. I think I think after the Afghanistan uh, pullout, the U.S. pullout, the, the Washington will uh, will uh, start losing interest in uh, in the region, 
and and perhaps it's not such a bad thing because I think I, th I think the meddling b both by Russia and, and and by the and by the U.S. at times has not been very healthy uh, for the uh, you know for Kyrgyzstan and for Uzbekistan. Uh, this sort of you know in this town is a very popular expression, the new great game. Sort of it's become kind of a trope, but it basically describes the the competition by the great powers, the U.S., Russia, China, uh, for the attention of of, of the local governments, um, and that. That competition has not often been very, uh, very helpful uh, to the local governance. So I think I'll, I'll stop here. I'm not sure if that answers anything. But. Yeah, and there's, there's actually, I mean, there, there's some more, more context to this. Uh, Kyrgyzstan was an early signatory to the World Trade Organization, along with China, actually, and Kyrgyzstan's benefited tremendously from trade with China. But Atambayev, the new president, has also promised to join this new Eurasian Union. Yes. that uh, Putin is trying to create this, this almost alternative uh, customs union in Central Asia and parts of the former Soviet Union. So, I mean, even from an economics perspective, like, like getting out of the kind of like real politic and great power competition, there are huge questions about Kyrgyzstan's economic future as well. If they can really survive as a teeny tiny country in a great big customs union as compared to right now where they actually have a trade advantage that gives them a little bit of, of currency inflows from essentially re-exporting Chinese goods. But I mean, like you said, it's, it's tremendously complicated. And, and looking at the future, I mean, I think a lot of people have, unfortunately, more question marks than anything else. Um, OK, so, so Alisher, welcome. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Uh, I, I mean, I'd like to hear your thoughts. What, what's your reaction to this? Can you hear me? Yes, you're good. Yeah. Uh, my pleasure to participate in this event. Really, really uh, pleased and um, uh, really pleased that uh, to know uh, Philip at last, because uh, the first uh, uh, meeting with Philip was with his book, actually, not with him personally. Mm -hmm. uh, it, I can't remember when the last time I read the hard copy of anything. He used to read from everything from iPad, from you know, uh, from these things, and we were given only one copy of that to Prague, which we we'll, would we'll share with Aida, and we became really <laughs> good friends over this. During. <laughs> 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 You know, like uh, <laughs> turning back. You know, have you read this? Yes. Okay. Where, where are you? I'm here. So you know. I think Alisher's uh, children is drawing. <laughs> yeah, actually, there was this nice picture of my kid on on the, on the book. Uh, signature, actually. Uh, so um, was really really a pleasure to read that book. Actually, as I've been saying, uh, this is the a book which uh, combines all all the most interesting, intriguing uh, events that happened since 2005 till uh, I guess uh, 2010. Uh, it's very compressed way, very uh, articulate uh, way. Uh, you know, you cannot find any anywhere else where all these most important events are are kind of a collected in one in one book. And I think this is really, uh, really uh, gives this book a special, I would say, value. Uh, I really like the the parts where uh, uh, where, where Philip uh, attributing to old Russian historians uh, like Nalivkin, uh, you know. And I thought that uh, indeed Philip will become next Nalivkin in hundreds of years. Will be read, will be, will be read that way. Uh, so, very fascinating book. Uh, as again, uh, most important topics. Whoever travels to the region, to Kyrgyzstan, to Uzbekistan, must definitely the must must book to read, and then uh, you'll be at least looking sm smarter, you know, uh, when 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 talking to other people. Like uh, whenever whenever somebody will will start some topic, if you if you read Philip's book, you you can easily kick in and continue the topic, you know, like. <laughs> Really, really uh, uh, fascinating and uh, easy reading. Uh, I mean, I, I was really, really kind of uh, interested in, in, in having that. And also I thought that Philip might be some old journalist who is like uh, finishing his career. And uh, he decided just to put everything together that he's seen in the region. Uh, and now I see that, that we hopefully we're going to have the continuation of that book. Yes. Philip. Yes. Third book. Uh, second book. <laughs> <I'm sorry. laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Cool. Th I, thank you, Alisher. I mean, I, I, I think as Philip said, like 
it, it's 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 interesting to deconstruct the past, but you know, looking at the future, there are huge question marks about what the U.S. and Uzbekistan relationship is going to look like, especially after 2014. What Uzbekistan itself is going to look like once the international community stops seeing it as this necessary transit point, and then also, um, I mean, we haven't talked very much actually about the 2011 election uh, when Rosa Otunbayeva, in this is in Kyrgyzstan, by the way, uh, Otunbayeva, who was the interim president voluntarily ceded power, and then they had this this freewheeling election. I mean, I was in Kyrgyzstan uh, in the month leading up to the election, and it was remarkable. I mean, the, the, the streets of Bishkek were covered in billboards with candidates for president offering their Twitter names so that people could debate things online. I mean, it, for, for, for people who studied uh, Central Asia either in school or from a historical perspective, seeing that in person was, was genuinely remarkable of almost this, this flowering of awareness and, and of participation in these things. But that also was overshadowed by the ethnic riots in Osh in 2010, which were, I, I mean, just, just astonishing amounts of bloodshed and, and, and communal violence. Um, with with Uzbekistan, I mean, we, we have, I think, a, a similar inflection point coming. Uh, Karimov, who, who runs the country, is, is clearly aging and, and running out of steam. And I think once he's gone, there's a, another just big question mark about what happens in that country afterward. And if there's a smooth transition to either another tyrant, if there's a free-for-all about who gets to run things. So, I mean, well... You know, looking at it kind of from, from a high level, from almost a DC perspective, Central Asia can seem kind of stead and, and a little bit unchanging. There are tremendous currents underneath the surface of anything. And I mean, just to get back to it, to praising you for a few minutes, like you actually got at a lot of, especially the, the, the political uh, currents that are happening and, 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 and changing all over the place. So that is a good pivot to open up the floor to questions. Um, I'm going to be uh, a, a little bit... Uh, I don't actually know what the right adjective is, but Christian's been a tremendous help in, in helping to publicize this book, and I'd like to at least give you the right of first question uh, in this if you want to um, raise any kind of issues. After that, we're going to open the floor up uh, to everyone in this room, including if, if any of you guys in Prague would like to jump in, just say something or, or wave your hands, and, and, and we'll make sure that, that, that you get a chance. And then also, because we're trying to be very 2010s about this, uh, we are running a hashtag on Twitter. I think it's hashtag Fergana with an H. Uh, and I'm going to be answering some questions either there or that people have been submitting uh, over Facebook as well. So uh, raise your hands and participate. Oh, ground rules, by the way. Um, keep them short. Keep them in the form of a question. We're not interested in lectures at the moment. Uh, and keep them respectful. So with that, that's your question. Well, thanks, Joshua. I'll be very respectful. <laughs> um, so, Bill, uh, a fantastic book. Uh, I may not have been paying attention as closely as I should have, but I don't think anybody so far has actually mentioned the title character of your book, which is not Kyrgyzstan or Uzbekistan, but actually the Fergana Valley. Hmm. Um, as you mentioned in the book, border the national borders in this valley, which actually uh, encompasses three separate countries, were drawn rather recently in modern history. Um, it's a very fragmented place, a place with a lot of, shall we say, simmering ethnic tension. Um, what, do you, what do you see as the short-term future of the valley? Uh, there are a lot of conflicts over resources, over uh, terrorism, over drugs, uh, over ethnicity. Um, what, where, where is the Fergana Valley headed? Uh, and do you think that there are viable ways to contain all of these tensions uh, in the next few years? Oh, thank you. Thank you for that, Christian. Well, it's, it's, the, the book is called Restless Valley. The irony, of course, is that this was the temporary title, uh, which I thought I would revise later, but then a lot of temporary things in life become, become permanent, and so, uh, and so here you go. Uh, but, but jokes aside, as, 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 as you right, rightly say, the history of, uh, of conflict there is just very long. The, the, the boundaries there were drawn by Stalin's ethnicities, uh, commissars, and uh, they were not entirely fake, those boundaries, but they were drawn in such a way as to divide and conquer, uh, because uh, Stalin and the authorities in Moscow at the time were, were very much afraid of the idea of a pan-Turkic entity emerging in, uh, I mean, that whole region was called Turkestan, uh, um, the, the sort of the Russian uh, Central Asia. Um, and so there was fear that uh, they would not one day would stop seeing themselves as Uzbeks or Kyrgyz or Kazakhs and would instead see themselves as this pan-Turkic entity 
maybe use Islam as an organizing force, and then the Soviet Union might have a problem. So uh, Stalin had this way of uh, uh, punishing crimes that had not yet happened, uh, so uh, or that might never happen. And so that's one uh, leg of that philosophy, if one can call it that, was exiling entire ethnicities that were deemed to be to perhaps become treacherous at some future point in Fergana Valley he sliced it up with these uh, with these borders that mostly uh, were meaningless when when they were within a broader political construct but began to matter a lot obviously in the early 90s when those countries became independent I think that the big problem there is not one of ethnic tension uh, but actually of, of lack of development uh, and of lack of economic um, um, opportunity for the people there it's a fairly crowded and with a lot of competition for resources um, and when people don't think they have what they deserve to have um, and we're not talking about a lot we're just talking about some basics then inevitably uh, as often happens we look for the other to blame and so uh, that that other uh, in Fergana Valley if you're a Kyrgyz turns out to be the Uzbek uh, if you're the Uzbek it might be Tajik I mean they're real um, uh, 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 problems there of ethnicity um, and in Kyrgyzstan in particular yeah, in the south of Kyrgyzstan so the Uzbek uh, community um, oftentimes dominates the uh, you know the the, the 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 towns they're sort of the traders the merchants the uh, the small businessmen the the Kyrgyz are oftentimes uh, you know they live outside of the city so their elements of class um, inevitably seep into it as, as people start competing for for resources I think the uh, um, the government of Kyrgyzstan has not done a very good job to put it mildly in terms of uh, uh, redressing those uh, uh, you know sort of fairly simple um, Uzbek they're not even demands but Uzbek concerns about their language, about education. Um, we're not talking about any secessionist tendencies, but uh, I think the government uh, basically sat on that problem for a while. Um, and obviously the clashes took place after the 2010 uh, 10 revolution. There were a lot of reasons for those clashes. I think the ethnic element was definitely there, but there were a lot of uh, um, almost invisible undercurrents of or organized crime, of, of provocateurs on many sides that sort of inflamed those tensions. Uh, going forward, I think, uh, uh, again, the restless valley, I think it will remain restless. And again, pardon the sort of somewhat flip uh, uh, description. Uh, but, it, uh, but it's mostly not because of the uh, uh, the people there, but it's because of the of, of, of the rulers of the, of the countries that, that meet there. I mean, uh, you have Karimov, we've said enough about him, great guy. Then we have, uh, you know, Tajikistan, very ineffectual state, also with a lot of its own problems. And Kyrgyzstan, perhaps the most progressive government, but incredibly weak, uh, especially in the South. So you don't really have any statesmen there um, with any sort of uh, uh, enlightened uh, ideas. So uh, so I think there's more, more restlessness to come, but hopefully not too much bloodshed. Thank you. All right, thanks. Oh, one, one other grand rule for this. Uh, introduce yourself. Let us know who you are. Sure. I mean... Prague, either either Alice or, or Aida. Do you guys have any uh, any follow up comments on this? Uh, yes, uh, I have a question for my <laughs> Alisher. I just uh, it's interesting for me about Uzbekistan. What will what uh, what is your opinion about after Karimov's regime? About lots of articles uh, about Gulnara Karimova and just briefly, can you explain us what is the <laughs> mood? Am I supposed to? Answer questions? Okay. <laughs> please, please. Yeah, Philip, please help. Uh, you know, uh, I will refer to you to the book, actually. Uh, this, uh, again, uh, the parts on Uzbekistan are rather uh, sh smaller, yeah. but more uh, vivid, I would say, in the book. You know, uh, I, I like the way that Philip, uh, uh, working with the facts, uh, you know, uh, each topic in the book can become a, a separate book itself. It's, it's rather highlights of the most important mm -hmm. things, and uh, you know, uh, which um, in the most time needs more elaboration for the for the experts. But for uh, for people who uh, actually uh, want to know briefly what's going on in the region, it's 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 excellent uh, uh, in, in that term. Uh, Philip. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, Aida. I mean, regarding your question, uh, Gulnara. Yes, uh, I, I think uh, Philip is dra drawing a really good picture of her. Uh, but there's a one problem when uh, you writing these things, which are still in progress. For example, Gulnara was uh, uh, <clears throat> actually described uh, in uh, in two as her situation described as if 
it was 2010. So I will quote, uh, actually I, I have that quote with me. Uh, it says that Gulnara is losing, uh, lost interest and slipped comfortably in uh, air, airhead style uh, lifestyle abroad. Mm -hmm. Yes, in 2010 that was the reality. Then, unfortunately, let's say, by 2012 she became incredibly, incredibly active and uh, Philip knows right now that uh, whatever she's doing right now uh, it's all it's all about PR. It's all about uh, you know uh, uh, kind of a, a gathering supporters, uh, kind of a holding campaigns uh, ranging from AIDS to sports to cinema and everywhere where possible. Anything. And her dance album that she released. Absolutely. No, I mean, th that is the past. But <laughs> now she's like, she's really acting as uh, as a politician because she is interfering in government's policies. Uh, he's uh, uh, raising the issue of business, raising issues, uh, really, really like political and uh, tough issues. And she's like everywhere. So uh, in that perspective, I think... Uh, that's why my question was the book needs continuation in that sense you know uh, continuation would be because uh, the story with uh, with Gurnara especially is not over there it's far from over uh, so and the problem uh, when you write or read these books uh, the things are actually evolving uh, during the process of writing I think this is the main challenge for for the author uh, I had a chance to read, the, for example, Vladimir Posner's book Parting with Illusions and uh, he was writing it over the course of uh, like uh, 10 years or, some, or so and while he was writing a book Parting with Illusions he uh, actually gained new illusions <laughs> and, uh, for for which he would need to write another book Parting with New Illusions, you know. Uh, it's like uh, uh, but Philip is really avoiding that in a, in a really, really uh, articulate way, I, I would say. You know, he's avoiding being criticized because he's like clearly uh, not really giving his opinion, but just describing how it is, how, how things looks like now. Uh, for, uh, for, especially for uh, Uzbek regime, the, the story is just the beginning. I, it, it's, 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 uh, it's, it's my analysis from what Philip wrote, actually. If, if All I, right. Um, cool. Thank you, Alisher. Uh, so I guess we can just start up here and then kind of work our way across. So. Yes, uh, David Abramson. I work at the State Department and uh, as an analyst on Central Asia. Um, one of the, I think, one of the strengths of your book was the, um, not just the um, capturing the color of events like Andijan and the revolutions in Kyrgyzstan, but the in-depth uh, coverage of a couple of uh, pr very prominent characters um, in Kyrgyzstan, um, uh, Sadr Kulov, as you uh, read that excerpt about, and um, Gurevich, a, uh, a very prominent uh, shadowy business connection to Kyrgyzstan. Um, I'm just wondering, um, just thinking more broadly for the region, uh, what if you could uh, extrapolate from your uh, more in-depth coverage and uh, access to Sadr Kulov, um, all of these countries have great cardinals or rumors of great cardinals working behind the scenes with very uh, close access to the presidents. And, and I'm just wondering, when, what your sense is when they pull away, when they're willing to risk um, uh, moving from that center of power and moving to the opposition. Uh, we don't see that in every country, but we see elements of it, such as in Tajikistan with a prominent businessman, former government minister, recently, Saidov. <coughs> so, I mean, the, the assumption is generally that they're conservative, don't want to take a risk, and therefore don't want to even risk a any kind of unrest, but, a, but would prefer a smooth transition to hold on to the resources they have. And yet, there are some people who uh, make these breaks. 
from the regimes. And I'm wondering what lessons you learned and yeah. could share about that. Oh, thank you for that, David. David, for those of you who don't know it, uh, organized this incredible thing called Central Asian is Happy Hour once a month. If you uh, <laughs> if you want to drink and at the same time talk about Central Asia, there's no better place. I've actually, as I was telling David earlier, I really miss it. It was a great group of uh, people. The question, uh, it's, it's a very good question. I think in a lot of places, but particularly in Central Asia, there's sort of, uh, there's the, uh, there's a process that goes on the surface. As we talk about Kyrgyzstan, there are elections, there are presidents, there are all these things that we identify with, considering that we know our own system. And I think sometimes that process is almost irrelevant, because there is an, sort of an, an, an underground or underwater process of, uh, of push and pull of essentially uh, dogs wrestling under a rug to, uh, to, uh, to, to use a perhaps not very uh, politically correct metaphor. But what we're talking about is these uh, incredible uh, uh, quasi-government uh, business corrupt entities, family clans that are essentially uh, grappling for power. Um, and the, uh, the system on the surface is oftentimes not adequate to accommodate them. And so then you have revolutions. And especially that, that, that sort of unsentimental take on events gained ground after this sort of the tulip revolution. At the time, people talked about democracy and freedom and, uh, and all these highfalutin terms. And I, I was one of them. I was totally snowed. Um, you know, you could really, you know, sort of start thinking, well, this is, this is something very, very positive happening here. Well, in reality, you know, of course, you had southern, very powerful southern clans allied with, uh, with drug trafficking and, and, and heroin uh, barons who, you know, felt like they were not getting a fair share of, of the political power in Bishkek. So they helped engineer the, the, the revolution. Um, something similar happened in the second go-round. I don't mean to be completely cynical about elections, presidents, and the sort of democratic process. Of course, it's, 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 it's a positive development. But as you say, oftentimes it, um, it, it, it sort of it obfuscates the, 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 the bigger truth uh, under, uh, under, under the surface. And it's true not only of Central Asia. I mean, it's true in a lot of places. It, it was true here not all that long ago. I think you know, maybe it's still true now. I mean, <laughs> but, it's, uh, it's, uh, but in Central Asia, because the, the states are very young and the organized crime is very strong and the, and the clans are very strong, you, you sort of see that dichotomy of the sort of electoral theater on one hand uh, and then this, you know, you know, less visible uh, competition for, for resources. And I think great calamities happen when the, uh, the, the people who feel like they're excluded from political power feel they have a lot more to gain from just overthrowing the, uh, the regime than, than rolling with it. And I think that's definitely was part of the story in, uh, in, uh, in Kyrgyzstan. That's actually a really good pivot point. Uh, we have a question on Facebook from Tamara Grigoryeva who uh, actually says, uh, first of all, she says she plans on reading your book, which is very nice. Then she says, as the third anniversary of the ethnic clashes in Kyrgyzstan South nears, where is the country now in terms of ethnic tensions? Is Kyrgyzstan South calm and more or less peaceful now, or is there a rather large possibility of another violence escalation? Um, it's a, it's a very, it's a very, it's a And very actually, I'd like to get uh, Aida on this after, after mm -hmm. answering, but... Um, well, I think the, the underlying causes of those ethnic tensions are still there, and the Human Rights Watch just came out with a, uh, with a very uh, cogent assessment of the fact that three years later, uh, so in those clashes, most of the victims were Uzbeks, and, and, and then most of the people who, who have been prosecuted or jailed as perpetrators were also Uzbeks. So you have this uh, uh, very uh, blatant case of sort of, of, of selective justice and of essentially blaming uh, the victim. A lot of Kyrgyz died too, but uh, the state, I think, uh, the state has a responsibility to be uh, more impartial in these uh, in these uh, investigations. And in the book, I talk about essentially um, I, I use just one case, uh, to, and it's a case that's well known to people who follow uh, Kyrgyzstan. The case of a uh, of an Uzbek human rights defender who's been uh, accused of um, instigating a savage execution of a Kyrgyz policeman and has been sentenced to life in in prison. He is still uh, serving out his sentence on evidence that was. Uh, Either uh, fabricated or uh, based upon the testimony of the of the policeman who had very uh, deep reasons to, to to dislike him. So the you know this is a very unfair trial. Um, and th th so he, his case is probably the most prominent one. But the very smaller uh, examples of the same problem happen with uh, alarming regularity in Kyrgyzstan. So uh, I don't think I don't think we're at a point of having another explosion of violence. I hope I hope that's not the case. Uh, primarily because I think what happened in 2010 was not just ethnic in nature. I think there are a lot of other factors at play there, including the old regime that had just been overthrown, that is on the record. Uh, well, was 
some phone calls have been intercepted, suggesting that they were interested in, in stirring up the, the unrest. Uh, uh, there were all sorts of uh, business and sort of uh, mafia interests competing for influence. So it wasn't just purely ethnic. So you would need a spark that's not ethnic in nature. Um, you know, you have protests in the South now. Uh, I think it, if, if someone really tried to ignite this, it would not be that difficult to do. And that's what's so scary. Uh, but I would, I, Aida knows this much better than I do. So if she could weigh in, that would be great. Yeah, it's a very difficult question even now and I'm from Osh uh, and live there till 17 uh, year and uh, now uh, the situation is okay because uh, three years ago it was uh, really uh, uh, awful and people uh, remember it and they don't want uh, to, um, to repeat uh, of the situation and uh, our president, uh, for the first time, uh, wrote an article. Uh, he didn't go on the third university, university to the south, as Philip says. Uh, it's not. Uh, it wasn't an ethnic question. Only one ethnic question. It was uh, another uh, things uh, regarding to Bakiev's regime, and uh, you know the. Uh, uh, policy of uh, mayor of the Osh Melis Mzakhmatov. He, uh, um, on the one side, he uh, he's a very uh, how criticized person uh, in Kyrgyzstan because he, uh, uh, Osh is uh, as an island uh, in uh, Kyrgyzstan because he can uh, uh, he can, uh, he's a, a uh, he's a real leader of uh, region, and uh, he can just uh, how to say with uh, negotiate with Atambayev with central power, and uh, uh, the most of the power in his hand. On the other side, uh, he has a really big uh, people's uh, uh, Kyrgyz people. Most of um, uh, most Kyrgyz people like them uh, as a leader. And uh, now uh, we just uh, uh, how uh, working and thinking what will be the next uh, step of the central power regarding to uh, Murzakhmatov. And uh, you know, most of you uh, uh, must uh, know the, about the Human Rights Watch uh, report on the co uh, court uh, uh, of uh, uh, Uzbek uh, people and. Uh, but um, and also we have uh, from uh, from administration uh, the conception, new conception about the inter-ethnic policy. And uh, but most of the experts criticized uh, this uh, conception uh, because um, uh, many questions now is uh, how how to say. Uh, we are improving Kyrgyz language and uh, uh, we don't say uh, openly about the real problem but now I think that uh, the three years is a very little period uh, to begin the open discussion. Now we're just thinking and saying every, everything will be okay and uh, we should uh, forget about it, we should live in friendship and uh, the situation is okay. It's, it's not five if it's a degree, it's four, mm. three maybe. <laughs> so. Okay, so let's get uh, next question here. Hi, uh, I first want to thank you very much for the book. I look forward to reading it. I'm, I'm Josh Maglia. <laughs> uh, I wanted to ask you, I know the book, um, you had said it focuses on Uzbekistan and Kyrgyzstan, but the book is called Restless Valley, and Tajikistan has to factor into that equation in some way, mm. and also in many ways sort of an outlier, and that it's remained relatively peaceful during this period, even during the time of its own, Tajikistan's own civil war. So I was just going to ask you a little bit, if you could fill out a little bit of the details of the Tajikistan part of the story or how it interacts with the other countries of the region. Sure. Thanks. Thanks for that, Josh. Uh, yes. So when you when you write these things, you have the incredible luxury of ignoring things you don't feel like writing about. And so, <laughs> uh, so the, the fact that Tajikistan is not there is not by any uh, grand intellectual design. It's mostly because I I just uh, didn't spend enough time 
on the ground there to feel that to feel that I could uh, pontificate with with any authority on it. I did spend some time there in the. Um, I bring it into the discussion a little bit because in one of the uh, chapters in the book, I talk about the heroin industry in in Afghanistan and the and the heroin trafficking that that takes place from um, uh, from Afghanistan and a lot of it goes north uh, over the river into Tajikistan and then uh, and then spreads from there. Um, Onwards uh, toward uh, Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan, and then and then to Russia, and then get most of it gets consumed or shot up there, and then uh, and then some of it travels onwards to uh, to Western Europe. As you know, a, a booming industry that has uh, you know in the past ten years uh, grown year on year, and um, Tajikistan has been uh, hit very hard by it just because it's the first uh, transshipment country, and so they've had uh, an incredible. Um, uh, rise in the number of uh, heroin addicts, uh, in the number of um, HIV/AIDS uh, 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 victims, because because of the intravenous uh, drug use, um, so they have had a, a real crisis uh, because of this. And as, as as you say, Tajikistan had just sort of come into this after a uh, a civil war. Where, I mean, forty, fifty thousand people. I mean, that's a that's a huge civil war. I mean, this is not ethnic clashes where four or five hundred people die. I mean, obviously, any death is tragic, but when you have uh, a massive event like this that Tajikistan is still struggling with, um, their entire government uh, that emerged out of that uh, after the civil war, the sort of the the national unity uh, uh, government is showing strains because of the, as you know, the some of the commanders uh, who had fought the government are not very happy. And so you have this weakened state, uh, and then all of a sudden you have this heroin tsunami, essentially, rolling across the river. Um, so it has a, a, a ton of problems. I did, do not write about Tajikistan as such uh, at, at, at length, other than in this heroin component, but I, uh, it, is, it is certainly something that uh, needs people to pay attention to. Thank you. Yeah, and, and that heroin uh, trade, I mean, that, that got tied, I think, to the clashes that happened in central Tajikistan. Mm -hmm. I forget if it was in, in, it was last year, right? Uh, so. Last summer, last July, when I think 75 people died in a series of, like, really massive shootouts. So, I mean, you're, you're right, that's, that's a huge issue. Um, but anyway, so, uh, any more questions here from D.C.? Yes, uh, go ahead. Hi, my name is Velida Kent, and I was born in Uzbekistan in Tashkent and grew up there till I was 26. My husband works for the State Department, kind of sent me here. Um, <laughs> he was one of the people who opened the embassy um, in Tashkent. And I kind of have a question. I haven't read the book, but I will. So, but I have a question for Ali Sher, same as um, for you, Philip. So, um, Ali Sher, um, very good friend of ours, uh, had your job, but Twenty, uh, 10 years ago in Prague. So, and um, I'm just curious, since I have relatives also in uh, Tashkent, not in Fergana, but um, in Fergana Valley, um, people are afraid. People are can't talk freely, of course, knowing the regime, Karima's regime, and really kind of bothers me. But um, how is your family doing? And how do you live in Prague? Are you? I mean, maybe it's maybe I shouldn't ask those questions because whatever you say may be used against you. I don't know. And also, Philip, how you were there talking to people and were they completely honest with you and Andijan, or were they really saying things what they really thought? I mean, how how did you feel about it? Because one thing is interview somebody and people reserve. I mean, I have my aunt who would call me and say, "How are we doing?" Meaning. <laughs> what do we know about them? Mm -hmm. What's going on in the region? Because they don't, or they're afraid of talking about it. So I'm just not curious, but just wanted to know if you had any issues with uh, the mm. local police or not KGB, whatever the. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So Phil. Um, that's a valid. Thank you. It's a it's a good question. It's. Uh, um, in Uzbekistan, it's tough as people are afraid, as you know. But I, I found um, just in general reporting in war zones or in dictatorships, uh, it is incredible what people will tell you if you're just willing to to sort of to be there and listen uh, mostly and not talk too much. Um, when, I, when I was in Andijan, people, uh, this was before the massive crackdown. I mean, some of the people I talked to uh, later went to jail, not because I talked to them, but the, uh, there's a, a human rights defender who was uh, put in prison for seven years, uh, Said Jahon, I think is his name. 
Um, it's it's tough. I, I don't have family there, so I think for the share, it's a lot more. Um, obviously, a lot more is on the line. I had a great aunt there who died in 2008, so uh, she lived in Tashkent. I'm a quarter Tatar, so uh, I talk about her in the book a little bit. But I don't have. A, I think it's 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 a real problem for for journalists like Alisher and others who actually have family on the ground, uh, as you say, and um, it's 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 a. For, for, for them, writing about these things has very serious potential consequences. So I think it would be interesting to hear what other, how other share struggles with that. Yeah, uh, personally, I left Uzbekistan after anti Jan events. Uh, I was also one of those journalists who covered that events. And uh, unfortunately, we were there a uh, day before uh, the massacre happened. That was the reason for government to claim that we were those who organized and uh, instigated uh, the massacre in Andijan, which is really serious, was very serious uh, charges at that time. So lots of us, lots of independent journalists had to leave. At that time, I, was, I, used, I, wo I worked at BBC, uh, World Service, uh, Uzbek Service. Uh, so uh, regarding the family, it's a really great question. Uh, I think that Uzbekistan is really repressive, but since it's not really mad yet, so like we we, we have, we have, you know, we've seen lots of uh, uh, retaliation and uh, on, on the family members, but not uh, against journalists, you know, against uh, uh, those who are like uh, more in public. Especially those who are, work for the U.S. government, you know, for the uh, for the media, which funded by Congress. I think it's they're not that mad yet. Uh, however, uh, you know, uh, they indicated that this might be another possibility for them in 2006. As you, if you know, if you know, don't know, uh, Uzbek uh, state television uh, broadcast a documentary about the Radio Free Europe Uzbek service, where the family members were highlighted in a very uh, uh, open way. Family members were profiled in the documentary. The addresses was told. Uh, it, it was really crazy type of uh, documentary, which actually uh, forced our uh, then president uh, uh, Jeff Gedmin to go to Tashkent to negotiate that we will be fine or our relatives will be fine. But uh, we never know, you know. Uh, however, we're trying to keep that. Uh, uh, you know that fear away from what we are doing here. Kind of, uh, we, we 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 don't when we work, we don't really uh, take that into consideration because it never has it, it has never been the case in you know in, in the reality. However, uh, none of our relatives really finding jobs. It's 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 hard for rel for relatives uh, to get, uh, especially public works sort of. Uh, work as a teacher or you know everybody relatives mostly uh, the relatives of, of my uh, uh, colleagues basically engaged in private things you know private trade business these type of things mm -hmm. well thank you uh, Alisher and thank you Aida unfortunately uh, we we are running out of time and oh we can do one more okay so we have time for for one more question then if we want to get get down here Thanks. Um, looking forward to reading the book. Um, Jeff Mankoff, I'm a fellow at uh, CSIS, the Russian Eurasia program. Um, you talked about a lot of the potential drivers of instability in the Fergana Valley and in Central Asia more broadly. One of the things that you didn't really discuss was um, extremism, Islamism, whatever you want to call it. And certainly this is something that the governments are very uh, keen to highlight in their discussions with the U.S. and with other government. So I was wondering if you could give kind of your on the ground perspective about what you see as the potential for religiously or um, Islamist derived uh, types of, of violence and radicalization in the future. Thanks Jeff. It's a, it's a good question. Um, I think it's particularly relevant for, for, for Uzbekistan. Um, I, I do not like to go into great length uh, about these issues in the book because I think it's a uh, uh, it's not a myth, but I think it's definitely uh, something that the uh, regime has exaggerated, and, in, uh, and 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 not only exaggerated, but has used that to crack down on 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 dissent across the board. Um, you know, as you know, putting um, 
all sorts of Muslims behind bars, many of them guilty of nothing more than going to, to the mosque. But I think I think Karimov has uh, created a self-fulfilling prophecy because he puts these guys in jail for a decade, they get tortured, and what are they going to do there? Are they going to come out? Being a, if they weren't Islamists when they got in, they're definitely going to be Islamists when they come out. And, and I, I don't, I'm not, I'm not going to be flip. Of course, the Central Asia has faced varying degrees of Islamist insurgency. The Islamic movement of Uzbekistan um, was active in, in, in northern Afghanistan. A lot of them died there, but a lot of them are still alive. And clearly, their goal is not um, their goal is uh, what it is: the caliphate. So. Uh, Uzbekistan under Karimov reminds me of the situation with Islamists there. It reminds me a little bit of the sort of uh, the scenario with the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt. I mean, these guys, uh, they were essentially the creation of Mubarak secret police. I mean, they, they, they got put through jails, they got stronger, and then so when Mubarak got overthrown, these guys actually had a... Uh, um, had a platform, they had a network. Um, Karimov has destroyed secular opposition, uh, but the, so the, kind of handing the Islamists uh, uh, a real possibility to uh, to present a, uh, a challenge to the regime. When I say Islamists, I don't necessarily mean the terrorists, obviously. I just mean people who use Islam as an organizing political uh, thought. So, but yes, in the book, I don't talk about it at great length because I think it's, it's oftentimes been exaggerated by Karimov, and so I, I didn't want to give him uh, too much credit and kind of go into these. Uh, conspiracies, uh, many of them, if not invented, then definitely embellished, like the one in Andijan, the Akramiya uh, case, uh, when, when uh, that led to the massacre. These guys were religious, but they were businessmen uh, in Andijan. They're, they, they, had, they had companies and factories. Uh, they were put in jail for this Akramiya Islamist conspiracy. So, And I think, writ large, this is what happens uh, in Uzbekistan. So. It shouldn't be ignored, but it shouldn't equally shouldn't be overstated. I think that that that, that issue that you bring up. Thank you. Yeah, George, that's can actually you, a, can a, I a good pivot throw to last, you, last question. Oh, I'm sorry, Alisher, you talked. Yeah, about this yeah. very interesting uh, thing that Philip is saying about Islamist. But uh, I have another question. Uh, since uh, Philip even started uh, by uh, by. Uh, you actually started by outlining that the uh, the region that U.S. is has to deal with Uzbekistan just because of its interest in Afghanistan, just because it needs to withdraw from Afghanistan at this point. Uh, this is the you know very widespread uh, view. But the question is what how is the uh, withdrawal will affect eventually Uzbekistan and Kyrgyzstan when finally we will not have a U.S. Uh, uh, interest so much in the reason in the region. Do they think? Do you think that uh, why, why like uh, st State Department they already thinking about it? You know what what they gonna do with the region, except from that uh, silly uh, Silk Road idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the Silk Road is the uh, is the new great game. So yes, um, um, I think uh, the. Again, it's it's hard to predict. I think the U.S. involvement, particularly this whole sort of military logistical uh, connection, uh, you know, but using the Central Asia as a transshipment point, I, I don't think that has been sort of very healthy. So uh, when that is gone, I don't think it's necessarily such a bad thing. I think it will it will remove a a a, a very skewing factor to local politics uh, in Uzbekistan and in Kyrgyzstan. And then if, I, I think the U.S. has essentially bigger problems now to worry about. I don't think there, I mean, I'm sure people in the State Department think about Central Asia, but I also think there are a lot of other issues that they think about in that part of the world once we are out of Afghanistan will unfortunately perhaps recede, if not to complete obscurity, then will definitely not be as prominent. Um, and there are good things about it, as, as I just mentioned, there's of course bad things about it. Um, and I think I think Russia and China will uh, will sort of fill some of that, some of that void. Um, just through trade and economic ties uh, in, in China with sort of the import of natural resources. So, And I mean, Kyrgyzstan also is going to be affected by this as well. So Aida, do you want to chime in here? Yes, yeah, sorry. Uh, I have just one uh, uh, question. Uh, you interviewed Gurevich in your book, Philip, and uh, do you believe that uh, uh, stop of the deal of Maxim Bakiv is a bear gaining from the U.S. regarding to the U.S. base in Kyrgyzstan? 
You know, honestly, I don't know. I, it's, uh, it would be fascinating if it were, and it might be, but I, I, I don't know. And since these are very concrete legal matters, it's sort of hard to speculate. Maxim Bakiev is the son of the former president. He uh, was, uh, uh, you know, under indictment for, for money laundering, and the case was mysteriously dropped up, uh, in the, the U.S. case against him, So, uh, which was built because Gurevich, this shady financier, essentially wore a wire and, and, and reported a lot of the conspiracy. And the case was dropped, and there's a speculation. Perhaps there is some quid pro quo uh, between the U.S. base and this, but, but I don't know. It, it would certainly not surprise me, but I just don't know. And uh, thank you very much, Joshua, uh, Philippe, and audience. You know the region so well. Uh, it's amazing for me. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. Um, we're, we're unfortunately out of time, but I really want to thank you, Aida and, and Alisher, both of you, uh, for participating in this. I mean, your perspectives made this very, uh, just incredible uh, and enriching. So I'm grateful that, that you were able to log in, and I'm also grateful that we were able to, to set this up here. So thank you very much for being with us. And thank you to Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, also for hosting this discussion. Uh, Philip's sit book is uh, available for purchase in the back for all of you who said you want to get his book and buy it. Now is a good chance to do so. Um, and a big thank you to Philip for writing such a fascinating book and coming here from Beijing to talk about it. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you.